Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I'll continue on the theme of the Coral Sea. So over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to visit some of Australia's most remote and isolated coral reefs. And these are the coral reefs to the east of the Great Barrier Reef in the Coral Sea. Um, so I just wanted to give you a bit of an appreciation of what the system is like. Some of these reefs take two days to get to. They're isolated atolls in the middle of nowhere, with surrounded by oligotrophic um, waters where very few people have ever been. And they're absolutely sublime areas. But if we, uh, if we look past some of these beautiful schooling bulbos and the occasional reef shark that you might see on pretty much every dive that you have in the Coral Sea, the underlying habitat is fairly, is fairly poor. And over its past, it seems the Coral Sea, uh, Coral sea reefs have faced some, some pretty intense challenges. And even when you do see corals, most of them are dead. And so the question is, has it always been this way? Surely, surely reefs that are so isolated and so remote um, would have some semblance of the vibrant coral reefs that we, uh, that we, that we often hear about. And so we've heard a little bit about the, uh, the surveys that have been happening on the, on the Great Barrier Reef. We know there's about 93 reefs that we survey every year for the past 25 years. In the Coral Sea, we survey three. And uh, we do so perhaps once per decade. And so we're not going to be able to um, get a very good sense of what these reefs might have been uh, like in the past, uh, just looking at these surveys. But they do give us some indication of, uh, of, of what might have been there in the, in the past. And our earlier surveys go back to 1984, surveys done by Tony Ayling, that many of you will be familiar with, and have been continued over the years by AMS and JCU. And we surveyed them again in, in 2016. And they reached a really low point in, 20, in, in 20, uh, 2003, 2004, maybe something to do with the bleaching uh, in an, or the stress bands that Tom identified in his coral cores. But really, since then, they've been recovering. Uh, despite everything that we're hearing about and everything that we see, we have, we have reefs in the coral seas that appear to be recovering. And if we, if we compare this to reefs in the similar latitude in the Great Barrier Reef, and so this is the LTMP data by Ames. Reefs in the Great Barrier Reef have been stagnant and fairly stable over a similar period. Although you do see that there can be some very big changes that happen over such a long, 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 long time scale. Now, we, we looked a little bit more broadly in the Coral Sea and, uh, and, and conducting some surveys uh, wherever we could, really. Um, and we see much of the Coral Sea, particularly the central part of the Coral Sea, is, uh, is in a pretty bad, bad uh, shape with uh, less than 20% coral cover at most reefs. But actually, in the, southern, in the southern part of the Coral Sea, we still have some reefs that have uh, relatively decent coral cover, uh, upwards of 40%, um, and even sometimes upwards of 80% coral cover, even on the exposed side of some of these reefs. Um, now, I know what you're thinking. In December 2016, when we did these surveys, this is immediately after a major bleaching event. And, and what we're, simply, we're seeing could simply be, be uh, down to some, some of those bleaching events. And sure enough, these reefs did bleach, and they did bleach pretty badly. Um, most of those uh, central reefs in the Coral Sea um, bleached up, uh, had up, uh, upwards of 60% uh, bleached corals. Uh, and, but uh, fortunately, there was no bleaching in these southern reefs. Uh, this wasn't going to, going to be the last time that they bleached. They bleached again in 2017 along, alongside the rest of the Great Barrier Reef. And this time, every reef in the Coral Sea bleached. Um, now, what we saw, however, was that the bleaching wasn't quite as bad as 2016. And that surprised us a little bit because the temperatures in 2017 were far worse than in 20, uh, 2016. Um, and so if we look at the probability or the bleaching uh, probability of coral colonies to bleach in each year or, or at different depths, we see that 2017, uh, the 2017 bleaching was, was uh, far um, 
or 2016, bleaching was far worse uh, despite much lower uh, degree heating weeks as uh, we've been talking about this uh, these past couple of days. And now there can be a number of different explanations for this. First of all, we may have simply just lost a huge part of the coral community in, in 2016 that simply wasn't present in 2017 to bleach. And to some extent, that may have happened. We did lose a portion of uh, Acropora throughout uh, many of these reefs, but it wasn't ex enough to explain these patterns. And so we have to look at some of the other explanations that might, might explain this. And perhaps degree heating weeks is not a very good predictor of uh, the likelihood of a coral to bleach. And in fact, we know there are many other factors that can lead to bleaching and uh, which, which might have uh, protected some of these oligotrophic and remote, uh, remote coral reefs. And the third explanation, as you just saw, is that we might have this sign of thermal uh, acclimatization following the 2016 ble bleaching as was present in uh, Tom's uh, coral cores. Um, but 2016 and 2017 were perhaps the worst bleaching event in uh, recorded history, but they were by no means the first. And uh, Tom's work shows these clear stress bands um, that we've associated with, uh, with uh, thermal stress going all the way back to the 1980s. And in fact, we've identified 10 events in the Coral Sea that may have, may have uh, 10 events with degree heating weeks above four, which may have led to some bleaching in this system. Um, but of course, this is only half the stories. As Tom said, Varieties are some of the most uh, tolerant species of corals to uh, thermal stress uh, and may not be able to pick up on these past events. And so we need to look a little bit more broadly. And so this, as of this month, we've started looking at, uh, in, uh, started processing our first batch of in situ dead coral assemblages in, in the Coral Sea. And so these are the corals that we, we quite commonly find. Corals that are partially dead, but still standing, or completely dead, and huge stands that don't seem to have uh, much going on in terms of coral. And so what we're able to do is actually date the pre precise time at which these corals die, um, and see whether or not that's associated with any thermal stress. Now, we've only, we've only processed a very small batch of these so far to, just to see what the data might show. So I don't want you to draw any conclusions from this, other than perhaps there's a lot of mortality going back in time. Um, we, we can't yet pick up on any of the uh, big bleaching events or anything like that, and it's going to require a lot more samples before we can actually tell what's going on here. But it does paint a more complete, it will hopefully paint a more, more complete picture of, um, of disturbance in the Coral Sea. Uh, of course, uh, thermal stress is not the only disturbance that might uh, uh, happen in the Coral Sea. Coral Sea is a, cyc a cyclone uh, highway for the Australian uh, coast with uh, more than double the number of cy cyclones affecting the Coral Sea Marine Park. It's highlighted here. Uh, than at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And, and, and we've seen this damage firsthand in places like Mellish that sit right in the middle of that red hot spot there, where you see these overturned priorities and, and old shipwrecks that have actually been spread across the entire reef flat. Um, and so we know that may, they may have an impact uh, throughout the system, but they, 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 the presence of cyclones is not always a negative. It can also have positive impacts in terms of mitigating uh, some of these um, strong heat waves. And so we're now in the process of collating some of this data to understand where these cyclones have been, uh, what impact they might have had uh, on coral sea reefs. And, uh, and try and have a better understanding of what, um, what damage they may have caused. I should say as well that the Coral Sea has got pales in comparison 
to uh, the number of cyclones that happen in the northern hemisphere. And so we, we obviously have uh, healthy coral reefs throughout the Philippines and Japan who, who withstand this sort of uh, uh, threat, it seems, on a regular basis. Now, some of you, at least, might be wondering, why am I, of all people, talking about coral reef disturbance? <laughs> Uh, well, I think as David Bellwood uh, pointed out yesterday, this is our new reality. And we have to understand how coral reef systems are going to react and recover from disturbances. And I think we, we understand what's needed uh, for coral reefs to bounce back after major disturbances. Um, and in fact, we can may maybe already see some of that recovery uh, occurring since the, nine, uh, since the early 2000s in the Coral Sea. Um, but as reefs get wiped out, your recovery may depend on uh, someone else. And if, uh, as a reef, if, your recovery, if you get wiped out, your recovery may depend on someone else. And we don't necessarily understand the processes uh, that lead to that recovery. But we know that for the Coral, uh, for the coral Sea, we have these main factors out there. We have this strong three-dimensional structural complexity. We have these deep oligotrophic waters, um, uh, and we have these low nutrient uh, loads that, um, that are important. Um, and now what I want to do is try and understand some of the processes that can lead to coral reef recovery, particularly for some of these isolated coral reef systems. Um, and particularly, I want to start to understand the role that uh, larval dispersal and connectivity has in kick-starting some of that recovery process. And so maybe we'll be a little bit more familiar with my, 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 my common territory here. So we've seen, we've seen, so one of the challenges that we have in the marine seascapes is that uh, estimating dispersal or connectivity is particularly hard. And we've seen a few examples of parentage analysis, which uh, the, uh, the bee's knees in terms of uh, identifying dispersal patterns and validating bi biophysical models. But they're really not applicable to a system like the Coral Sea. Assignment tests, we've used these in the past. They're fantastic, but they, they really require very unique uh, systems, uh, like in this case, in the southern coast of Oman, where we see a lot of uh, endemic species uh, that only occur in these two little patches here. And so really what we're left with are these traditional tools of population structure that some of you might be familiar, and that we commonly, or commonly, that you might uh, know as FST. The problem with these is they're really bad at estimating connectivity. Uh, if uh, even if population A here is the own is the own uh, the, the 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 own sole source to populations B and C, uh, B and C will look identical to each other simply because they have that common source, um, and we will we will assume that these two reefs are actually connected, and so we've been working with some fairly new methods. Um, which are based on uh, genetic covariance and, and anchored in graph theory, to be able to identify only the connections that are important within the system, and they explain the overall genetic variance that we can observe. And once we do that, we can start to understand the strength of these connections as well. Uh, now, they, there are some pretty big limitations to this. Uh, one of them is that you have to sample the entire population or the, 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 the source of genetic variants within your population. And so you really can't leave any populations behind. The other limitation is that we need very good estimates of genetic variants for each of those populations. And that makes things a little bit more challenging. Um, but it's a fun challenge. Uh, we went to every, every reef in the Coral Sea and collected uh, samples of, uh, of, of coral trout, in this case, from 19 reefs, almost 500 samples. I'll spare you the details of how we did the uh, next generation sequencing, uh, but 
for those of you interested, that's the, the pipeline that, that we followed. And we get some very um, extensive range of, of markers. But of course, because connectivity in a system is not simply down to a single species, and in fact, much of your biology has a lot to do with uh, how you disperse within the system, we couldn't just stop at the coral trap. We had to do another coral reef fish. Uh, and in fact, we did a coral, uh, Acropora tenuis, and uh, a reef, uh, reef shark, uh, a white-tipped reef shark. Uh, to try and get, get to, to an understanding of how different species uh, interact with their environment and are connected throughout it. And the Coral Sea lends itself particularly well to testing these ideas of, of, uh, of, uh, of looking at um, connectivity because of the number of reefs that are so isolated from, uh, from one another. Mellish here, reef here, that we didn't get many centropygies from, but we did get quite a few trout, uh, is m m about 200 nautical miles from nowhere. Uh, and so you have to wonder, you know, how, how are these systems replenished? How are these individual atolls that are only a few kilometers long uh, replenished? And so here I'm going to show you what those connectivity patterns are. And this work is still very preliminary. Uh, we're still working on some, some, of, uh, some of the methods. Um, and I don't necessarily want you to dwell too much on who's connected to who, or who's isolated, or who seems to be seeding what. Um, because ultimately, this is a tool. This is a, a, a new tool that we can use in terms of estimating some of these uh, connectivity patterns, and particularly in validating some of those biophysical models that we've heard of uh, this morning. And it's a tool which we can use to identify the underlying processes that are shaping some of these patterns, whether they're biological or physical. And the, and the last, you know, the, the, the last, the last, uh, the last thing I, uh, I want to leave you on is whether or not the these uh, connectivity patterns can actually lead us to understanding how the Coral Sea uh, and its potential for recovery may uh, lead us as a, as a refuge for perhaps what's going on in the Great Barrier Reef. So uh, what we can tell uh, so far from what we've done in the Coral Sea is that it's been through pretty tough period with a long history of disturbance. And we think that's mainly been from coral bleaching. But obviously, we still have a long way to go before we can, we can really tell what that is. Um, and it's going to require us to look at all the uh, temperature stress and wind regimes throughout this system and using some of these tools like uh, what Tom presented to you uh, earlier and, uh, and the work that uh, John Pandolfi is leading. And our, our systems of understanding connectivity, uh, well, that's still a work in progress, and I'll ho hopefully update you on that in the future. I'd just like to thank everyone who's joined me on these expedition. It's been an incredible team, and I've been very fortunate to, uh, to be working with these people and continuing working with them. And everyone who I'm now working with now who shares a similar interest in understanding the process in Coral Sea, and of course, I'm uh, grateful to the ARC and uh, Parks Australia, who's funded a lot of this research, and colleagues at CALST and throughout Australia who've been involved. Thank you very much. Thank you.